Welcome to Obsession Engineering. It's new project time and it's my SP1 that's on the bench this time. For anybody who missed the introduction test ride on this bike, this is a 18,000 mile, technically SPY, VTR 1000 SP1. I've been looking for a nice example of an SP1 or SP2 for a while and this one turned up at the right price so I went and snapped it up. It is almost completely original and I want to keep it looking completely original but I want to make it ride a little bit better. Having test ridden it I can tell you the forks actually feel not too bad, the brakes stop it eventually uh, but the rear shock is basically a disaster zone. So what I'm going to do in the next few episodes is take bits of it apart, do items one by one so you can see how to strip and rebuild individual items and then hopefully when we finish we'll have a bike that rides considerably better but still looks like the iconic SP1 shape. So today I am going to start at the front, I'm going to take some bodywork off it, I'm going to take the forks out of it and I'm going to go and make them even better. Before I actually start ripping bits of the bike apart though, I am going to do some measuring because I want to check what the sag settings are like right now. The sag settings are really important to how a bike is going to ride. Basically the order you need to do your suspension is get the right springs, get the right preloads, which is the right sags, and then look at the damping later. There is no point having lovely damping if you're already three quarters of the way through the travel because the spring is wrong or vice versa, the damping might be lovely, but if the spring's rock hard, your bike's never going to ride right. Having checked online, these have a 10.0 newton spring in them as standard, which is quite racy for a road bike, but actually will work quite well if I get the preload set right. On the test ride, it actually feels quite good, but I just need to check the measurements and see if it's in the right ballpark, because there is a bit of an issue with SP1 forks. Basically, the fork springs are actually too short for the forks. I've found this before that when you take the forks apart, if you wind the preload off, the spring basically rattles around in the fork, and that's not a lot of good. So you have to run with the preload wound almost all the way in to get the sag settings even remotely close to where you want them. And then, of course, it means I've not got any sag left. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to measure the sag in the front of the bike and that will tell me how long I need to make the spacers in the top to actually give me a reasonable range of adjustment. I will admit doing the sag measurements is considerably easier with at least one extra body. But I haven't got any mates today so I'm going to show you how to do it without any assistance. And it's not ideal but I want to actually get on with the work and I need to do this first. So let's get cracking. So I have the bike on a front paddock stand so the forks can sit fully extended with the wheel off the floor. The next thing I've done is put a cable tie on the fork leg. Yes, it's cable tie, it's not the prettiest way to do things, but it is functional for now. And if I push that up to the dust seal, I'm then going to measure between the top of the cable tie and sort of the top of the fork bottom, the bottom of the stanchion, whatever you want to call it, and get a basic measurement. And these forks are 124mm long when fully extended, and we're going to write that measurement down. With the bike off its paddock stand, I'm going to take three measurements. The first one is with me not sat on the bike, so literally just the weight of the bike sat on the fork. And that is 97mm, but this is the least important state because you don't ride your bike without you sat on it, so getting the sags right with you sat on it is much more relevant. For measurement two, I'm going to get on the bike as gently as I can so the bike settles down onto its springs without it going down and coming back up. Now I'm doing this with the bike on a paddock stand and obviously that lifts the back of the bike up, puts more weight on the front naturally and tilts the bike at a bit of an angle. So it's not perfect but when I've checked it doing it off the paddock stand to doing it on the side stand and standing up and trying to get my weight on it, it makes about a millimetre difference. So to get us in a ballpark, we're not going to worry too much about it. And it is considerably safer to do it this way than it is to just try and balance it on my tiptoes and play around with, with the cable ties and stuff with nobody else here to help. I want to get on the bike really quite gently. And I can feel the forks move down a little bit. That sort of normal riding position, feet on the foot pegs. And now very gingerly get back off again because I don't want to push the cable tie any further, any further down than necessary. 91 millimetres, so I'm going to write that down. Third measurement, I'm going to get on the bike 
hold the brake on, give it a bit of a bounce. And basically the difference between the two is the first measurement is how the bike settles on its springs. The second measurement is how it comes back and recovers. And basically there will be a bit of stiction in the forks, a bit of drag. And what we're trying to do is get through that and basically get an average of the two readings. So lean forward, push the cable tie up. Again, this would be considerably easier with a second person, but this is what happens when you've got no mates. So last measurement, 78 millimetres. So looking in my notes, I had 124 millimetres of travel to begin with. We're kind of ignoring the 97. Sometimes this measurement is useful, but only if you're actually working out spring rates and we already know them. And so the two measurements I'm really interested in is 91 millimetres, 79, and the difference between them is 12 millimetres. There is a reasonable amount of drag in these forks, but it's a cold day as well, so the seals will be a bit stiff and the oil's probably quite old. So the average between those is 85, which means we've got 39 millimetres of sag. What I'd like is 30 to 35 millimetres of sag. And so I now know I need to get enough extra preload into the spring to get the sag measurement better than this and take up the slack, basically, that's been taken up by just winding the preload in to begin with. So this was an important little test. And that's the list of jobs I actually need to do on the bike. Right, so boring measurements done. The next thing to do is actually get the bodywork off it and the forks out. Luckily, the SP1 dates back to an era when you could actually take the fairings off a bike without needing to go to the Honda University for fairing fasters and fiddly things before you could actually get to anything. Thank you, Honda. You actually made a bike that was easy to work on. So that's all the fairing removed from the SP1, and this bike's been pretty simple to get the fairing off, unlike anything new that's made by Honda. Basically, the older the bike, generally the easier the fairing is to take off. Nowadays, the manufacturers love hiding little tabs out of the way and locking the panels together in 17 different ways. And they don't want, you know, the bolt that holds this together, they don't want it on show. And so nowadays, stuff is getting more and more awkward to take the fairing off. But this was lovely. Unless they'd put quick release fasteners on, that wasn't really going to get any easier at all. To take the forks out, I need to remove the brake calipers, the front wheel, the mud guard, and then basically undo the yokes and the handlebars, and then the fork tubes can slide out. If this was a customer bike coming in, I could have actually got to the bottom yoke bolts with the torque wrench to put everything back together with the fairing on it. But I need to get underneath to give everything a clean, and it's a lot easier for me to show you how to get to stuff if we can actually see it. So, taking the fairing off, not a bad job. Now she's naked. So I have the mud guard and the calipers removed, and I've just cable tied the calipers up out the way so that they're not rattling around and dangling on the brake lines. Now my mud guard has at some point had a disc lock left on it, and it's broken the front of there. Uh, it has been uh, sort of plastic welded around the back, and I'm going to have a look online if there is a cheap, nice replacement mud guard. I might order it. But if not, I shall drop this off with my painter and just get him to make a slightly nicer job of that. It's not a big problem, but I'm aware of it, so I'd like it to be a little bit nicer. So the next job is to take the front wheel out. So on a Honda, there's a basically a bolt that goes in the end of the spindle to hold it all together. So we'll get a socket on that. Get that undone. I'm only going to take this halfway, two thirds of the way out to begin with. So unthrough unthread that a little bit and then I need to get a T-handle on there, undo my pinch bolts but with the right size Allen key, uh, T-bar because this isn't it. it, doesn't fit. So with my pinch bolts now removed from their holes uh, you actually don't need to take them all out your way, you can just loosen them but I've taken them all out today and the reason for leaving this halfway undone is that you then have somewhere to give a tap with a soft mallet. Uh, this is my Thor two pound half hide, uh, half copper, half hide hammer. Um, it's a little bit battle worn now, but this might be my favourite tool. It's had a lot of use over the years, this hammer. With the bolt now removed all the way out from that side, slot, the, uh, slot an Allen key or something in the other end of the spindle and just take the wheel out. Relatively easy, but admittedly easy with two hands on. So Going to put the camera down. Our next step is to undo the yokes and the handlebars and drop the forks out. But there's a couple of little bits I'm going to do first to make life easier later. 
when I undo the top yoke clamp, I'm going to undo that one first, and then I'm going to crack off the top cap for the fork. Uh, you want a very well fitting spanner or socket because these might be quite tight because it may have been years since they've been undone. Um, undoing the pinch bolt first relieves the tension on the thread so you've got more chance of getting it undone. As this is standard production bike the height of the fork is actually sort of um, pegged by the handlebar and the handlebar is pegged to the yoke so you can't actually get this height wrong when you put it back together. If it's on a track bike or a modified bike it's always worth measuring this distance here so you can put the fork back at exactly the same height. Also if you have handlebars that can be moved it's worth putting a little mark on them so you know the correct orientation when you put them back in. Anyway enough talk I need to undo that first crack that off and then I can undo the handlebar the bottom yoke and just slide the fork out. Now when you're undoing the last pinch bolt Always a good idea to hold on to the fork because the fork is moving already there. Uh, some bikes they'll be really tight in the yokes, some will move quite easily. But this one's going quite easy, so we just need to lower that down and slide the fork all the way out. Now, because this is Honda, uh, there is a little circlip on here, and the circlip basically locates the handlebar in the right place. So take that off and put that somewhere safe with all the fairing fasteners. Right, so that's one fork leg ready to go upstairs into the suspension lab. Let's get the other one out. So that's both forks removed and one of my other little tricks is to cable tie uh, the handlebar up to the top yoke because that very, it stops it flapping around and pulling on the cabling or getting trapped in anything. So I'm upstairs in my suspension area now and I have the forks with me and some parts. So I'm going to be changing the fork seals. So in this packet I've got the oil seals and the dust seals. And then in my nicely arranged ones that have fallen over, uh, basically these are the bushes that go inside the forks to let the two tubes slide against each other. Now they may look and feel okay, but being as these are now over 20 years old, a few quid for some new bushes is definitely not a bad idea. If I was just changing the fork seals, I probably wouldn't need the bushes. I might not even need the dust seals. I might just need the oil seals out of there. But because I'm treating this bike nicely, uh, I'm putting a few extra bits in. And the extra bits don't finish there. In here is some magic, basically. These little bits in here, these are the pistons and the valves that control the oil. It's because these control the oil, they control how good the damping is. And these are the road spec versions from KTEC. So we've got rebound and compression valves. And basically they control the oil more accurately than the originals that are in the bike and give you a nicer feel on the road. You basically get a smoother ride and more control of the oil. They're not critical. The front of the bike is pretty good. But I just thought if we're taking stuff apart, why not treat it to some really, really bling little bits? To go with my new pistons and valves, you can, of course, actually get the little flow control valves that go on the outside of the forks. They're pretty in red and they look very nice, but being as I'm trying to keep my forks looking standard, I'm just living with the standard compression adjusters and those things inside. First thing I've done is given the forks a clean, mostly because as I'm taking things apart, or even worse when I'm putting things back together, what I don't want to do is transfer dirt from, say, the outside of the tube into the bits inside the fork, because that is definitely not a good idea. What I've also done is given them a really good clean down here and look for any pitting. Now this fork has, and I don't even know whether you can focus on it, this tiniest, tiniest little pit mark there. And basically that will either be a bit of a stone chip or even a little bit of salt that's just flicked up onto it, and it's just eating through the chrome and it's just bubbling up the metal underneath it. Obviously, the further down the fork travel you get, the more chance you've got of getting pitting because basically the seals and bits aren't scraping and they're not leaving a tiny bit of oil all the way down here. This section might not ever even get used, which is why it's more susceptible to pitting. All right, so I have an oil stone, or technically an India stone, which is even finer, a little bit of oil on it, and I'm just going to really, really gently run that across that pit mark there. And you can see already I've barely had to touch it clean that off and it's just taken the top like any shards of sharp metal off the top of there so when I'm putting the new seals and bits in I can push everything to the bottom of the uh, stroke and I've not got a risk of damaging my new seals. If your stanchions are more heavily pitted it is going to be a problem because obviously the pitting after a while will come back and will of course just rip into the seals and then you're going to get oil seals leaking again. Um, so 
If the stanchions are particularly bad, they might need to be removed and either re-chromed or replaced. To be fair, re-chroming them is not that different a price to actually just buying a new set, um, and so it's generally a lot faster to just put a new set in if they're available. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to measure where my adjusters currently sit. So, screwdriver, and I'm going to count in. So, one, two, three, right, so that's nine clicks from fully in, and I'm going to count how many clicks there are in total. So we start there, you feel the adjuster bottom, the first click is zero, zero, one, two, three, 13, 14, 14 clicks, which is about normal on sort of standard Japanese forks. And it is going to be very important later that we know how many clicks are on these. And in fact, what I'm going to do is wind the adjuster all the way in so it bottoms, and that is handy for later. The next thing to do is measure the preload. So conveniently on these forks, they've got little preload rings, so you can just basically count how many rings you've got showing, and I'm going to change the preload anyway, so it's not too critical, but having all your damping and preload settings written down is useful for later for when you put stuff back together. I'm also going to check the compression adjuster setting, and the other reason to check your settings now is so you can actually tell whether the adjusters are seized or not, because it's a lot easier to fix the seized adjuster while you've got the forks in bits. Putting it back together and then finding it is just disappointing. And now we've done even more measuring, it is time to actually take stuff apart. So, 32mm spanner, get that on there, and you want a spanner that fits nicely so that you don't damage your anodizing. And there's a reason we cracked these open in the uh, bike earlier, because doing them in the vise tends to involve clamping them really quite tight. So with the fork top unscrewed, I can slide the tube down like that and expose the tube inside which has little holes in it, and we're going to need those to compress the spring. And when I mentioned earlier that the spring in these forks can basically just rattle around if you don't have any preload on it, if I pull the top out spring a little bit, the tubes and the spaces that hold the springs in rattle around quite a lot. I'm not really sure how Honda passed this off as acceptable, because I don't think it is. So with the fork in the fork spring compressor, I can wind the compressor down and compress the spring. Hence why it's called the spring compressor. Um, obviously, if you're doing this at home, you may not have a big spring compressor like this one. Uh, you can get little clamps that you just basically pull down with your hands. Uh, and they do work. They are fiddly sometimes, but they will do the job if necessary. Now I have the spring compressed, I've exposed the nut here that's at the top of the damper rod. So I need to get a spanner on that, a spanner on the top cap, and I need to separate them like that and then I can wind the top cap off the damper rod. And the top cap in this instance has the actual um, needle adjuster for the rebound attached to it. So we pull that all the way out. Eventually, it's quite tight. And you see on the end of there, there is a needle for adjusting the uh, rebound damping. But we're not gonna be using that one because we've got a KTEC one. There's a washer for the preload, uh, basically a little adapter ring. And then we need to take the load back off the spring so we can get the spacer and the spring out. It's always a good idea at this stage to put everything on your bench in the order you took it out. So I've got the top cap, the preload uh, spacer and all the bits in order uh, and that makes it easier to put everything back together later. So I have my fork hanging up, draining into a sink. Now the sink obviously drains into a bucket that's full of old fork oil and shock oil. Uh, it's obviously not going down the mains. The oil in this isn't actually too bad, and I'm guessing when the bike was recommissioned a couple of years ago, it probably had the fork seals and oil changed. But I'm still going to do it again because I'm going to improve it anyway. And as mentioned before, I have everything laid out in basically the correct order. The top cap with the uh, adjuster needle on it for the rebound, and then I've got a spacer, uh, like a washer for the preload, uh, an adapter, the preload ring, and then the spring. If it's laid out in order, it's a lot easier when you're putting stuff back together. Now that my fork leg is relatively drained of oil, I need to split the stanchion from the outer so that I can get to the seals that are in here. So the first thing I need to do is push the dust seal out of the way, and the easiest way is with a flat screwdriver. Uh, you just want to be a little bit careful that when you put a bit of pressure on it, you don't mark up the aluminium of the fork leg. So that's that pushed away from there. So up in here there is a circlip, so I've just got my screwdriver in there and I'm being quite careful not to... Uh, get in there too harsh and scratch anything, and I'm just gonna flick the circlip out the way, which is sometimes easier said than done. Right, circlip out the way, 
uh, little spots of rust on that because it's also been damp in there at some point. And the next thing I need to do is slide these two tubes apart. So some more modern forks will just literally at this point slide apart because both of the guide bushes are inside the actual outer aluminium and they're pressed into that. But these are not built like this. These, one of the bushes lives on the chrome and one lives in the fork leg. So you actually need to knock them apart to knock the bush out of place. So we'll get down to reasonable position and repeatedly sort of hammer the... Uh, bushes apart. It seems quite brutal but it is the only way to get them apart. And obviously the when it comes apart it tends to come apart with a little bit of um, action. So now we can actually see the bushes that I'm talking about. This one lives on the stanchion and if I get my fingernail in there I can sort of separate it a little bit as if by magic with two hands. Um, I can slide that bush off then this one just slides out the way. Then there is a metal washer that basically seats the um, bushes and keeps them away from the actual fork seal. And then we have the fork seal itself. Obviously, because we're not going to use this again, I don't mind dragging over the sharp edges on here. If you were just changing fork seals, this would be the halfway stage. But I'm going a little bit more in depth. So the next thing I need to do is take the cartridge out that lives inside here. So I need an Allen key up its little bottom there to undo the bolt that holds the cartridge in place but I also need to put a holder in here to stop the cartridge spinning when I'm trying to undo the bolt. Obviously not everybody's going to have a cartridge holding tool but a lot of the time you can undo the bolt in the bottom with an impact gun and if you take the bolt out or at least loosen it before you actually take the rest of the fork apart it's quite common that the spring pressure from the main spring over there uh, is enough to hold the cartridge in place but sometimes it isn't and that's when you need a cartridge holding tool. So this is the cartridge that lives inside the fork. This end is bolted to the bottom of the fork and this end has the top cap attached to it. So basically the two bits go up and down independently, like this. That is not the piston though, that is the bump stop. And on this it's a hydraulic bump stop. The advantage to a hydraulic bump stop, as it pushes into there, the oil that's trapped in here basically slows the piston moving down and basically gives you a nice gentle in, uh, introduction into your bump stop. The disadvantage to this is when it's trying to pull back out any oil it's displaced out of here, as you're trying to extend the fork again, it's basically creating a little bit of a vacuum. Now this does move up and down, and it is supposed to let the oil back in, but as we'll find out when we're actually bleeding the fork up later, it never quite works as easily as it should. And so at the bottom of the stroke, when you need the fork to recover as quickly as possible, that is actually restricting it a little bit. On a race bike, you tend to have rubber bump stops instead of hydraulic bump stops to get rid of this problem. But the problem with rubber is it can break, deteriorate, fall apart over time, and so in a road bike it's not particularly practical. If we look at this, we enter the bump stop, and then we've got about an inch of travel to the bottom of the bump stop. And that is conservative for road bikes that will go over the potholes and go through a lot in their life. To me, it's a little excessive because it reduces the amount of actual available fork travel that you really want to be using. So what I'm going to do is about 10 millimetres down here, I'm going to drill a little hole in it, and that will let a bit more oil in and out and basically reduce our bump stop from 25 mil to 15 mil, which I think is still ample. To get the piston and the shaft out of the cartridge, I need to remove the bump stop so the whole thing can go that way. The bump stop is held on with a circlip and the engines of here are peened over. So I've just opened the peening up a little bit with a purposely sharpened punch that I've got. I've knocked the bump stop out of the way and exposed the circlip. If this were a race bike, I would get rid of the bump stop completely and not bother with it uh, so that we don't have the problem with it trying to uh, open that vacuum up that we've seen before. So I just need to pop that circlip out of the way, slide the bump stop out of the way, and then I can slide that shaft all the way out of that cartridge. So this is the damper rod with the rebounder damper on the end of it. So what we've got here is one side of the piston has a series of little shims on it and the other side has a non-return valve. When the fork is in compression and flowing that way, the oil basically pushes through some little holes in here, opens this little non-return valve up and lets the oil just flow through the holes. Nice and easy, very little restriction. When the fork goes back the other way in rebound, some of the oil can go up the middle of here, because there's a hole, and out this little hole here, that is adjusted by the adjuster that's connected to our top cap. 
it's just a bypass. The rest of the oil has to go through another series of holes and push against the shims. And the faster the fork is moving, the more oil you have pushing these shims and just basically springing them apart. So basically, the faster the fork is moving, the more damping you get um, and the more control you get. If you just had a plain hole, it would get to a point where the hole can't cope with anymore and the fork basically locks up. Or if you had a really big hole, you basically have no damping. So that's why we have an adjuster. But the adjuster, of course, only alters how much oil is bypassing the shim stack. To alter how it actually feels once we're into the actual shims, into these bits, we need to change the shims, which you could just take these off and alter the shims that are on this piston. But the KTEC piston is also a different design, so it flows differently. So what we're going to do is take this off, I'm going to warm it up a little bit with a blowtorch, unscrew this one off the end of the rod, and put a whole new piston on. Now we've got everything apart, we can see it in a bit more detail. This is the standard shim stack, this is the KTEC one, so this is just the rebound adjuster. Uh, there is a bigger range of shims on here, so it'll give us a wider range of damping. The actual holes through the uh, piston are a different design as well, so they flow differently. And interestingly on this one, there's quite a lot of preloading on the non-return valve. The idea of that is that when the fork goes into compression, this won't open as easily, so this piston will actually generate a little bit of compression damping as well which basically should give us a bit better control. Now we can see here there is a hole down the middle of there and that goes through to these holes here so basically that bypasses this whole shim stack. This is actually the adjustment needle we're going to be using so basically this lives inside here and this if you wound it all the way in would block off the uh, access from this hole to the bypass and then if that's blocked off all of your damping oil has to go through the shim stack, so it's going to feel quite firm. If we wind this out of the way, more and more oil can flow past the shim stack, and in fact you get less damping or more open damping. So that's basically how the rebound adjuster works. The compression works in pretty much the same way, but backwards. So I've popped the cartridge back together, I've put the bump stop back on, the circlet back on, and just peened the uh, edges over on the peening there to hold the bump stop in place. And now I can move on to the compression adjuster. Now normally the compression adjuster would actually live in the bottom of the cartridge down there. But on the Honda, they've put it out the front of the fork like this. Nice and easy for access. I thought I was being clever by leaving the compression adjuster block on the bottom of the fork. Turns out uh, you can't get the top out. So I just need to undo those two cap screws, take the whole lot off. And here we have all the bits for the compression adjuster. Uh, this is the bit that sits at the bottom of the fork, and I've just got to be careful not to lose the O-rings off that. And these are our two compression stacks. So as we can see from here, the shim stack design is different between the KTEC and the original, and the actual shape of the um, holes in the piston will be different as well. So what I need to do next is unscrew this one and fit that one. But a question at the back I hear you shout. Why, yes, if on the rebound stack the hole is open for the bypass and oil is just flowing through it, then surely it's not moving any oil to push through the compression stack. And you're nearly right. Basically the compression stack is only really activated uh, by the oil that is displaced by the shaft running into the cartridge. So really these are not going to make as much difference as the rebound adjustment, which is why we always adjust the rebound first and compression second on this type of fork. So now I have the KTEC piston and shims fitted to the original adjuster, I have all the bits of the original compression valve laid out. So these three bits are just literally bits of um, non-return valve. And then the piston is the important bit. And so if we lay that on there, we can see where the non-return valve would be. And basically when the forks uh, moving the opposite way in the rebound direction, the non-return valve will just spring open and oil will flow out of these big holes. When it goes into compression, oil will go down the little holes, and that will try and force this shim open. And obviously that shim's got all these other shims on top of it, and depending on how many shims and what thickness and what size, depends on how much pressure you need to open the uh, shims up. And obviously depending on the piston design, depends on the surface area you get from these holes as well. So it all goes into adjusting how much damping you actually get and at what speed you get it. So you could just take shims in and out of these different stacks and try and get the damping you want, or you can just go to KTEC because they've done the hard work for you.
with my compression adjuster refitted at the fork bottom, uh, it's time to put the cartridge back in. There is a little collar that sits on the end there, so I've made sure that's in place. And so all I'm going to do with that is literally just slip it up the hole. Just like that. And then if we come to this end, I have the bolt with a smear of grease on the o-ring. So that needs to go up that hole and screw back into the cartridge. Now I have my cartridge refitted, I have slipped a very thin plastic bag over the end of the fork. And that is so when I slide the seals on, they're less likely to get nicked on these bits of metal on the sharp edges on the fork. And talking of seals, I have new dust seal, old circlip, new oil seal, old washer and then new bushes. So one by one, we're going to take a seal, slide it over the end of there, and then slip it down the fork leg like that. And because we're using the plastic bag, we're less likely to damage the seals. So now we have everything arranged on the fork leg. New dust seal, circlip, new oil seal. I'll just put a smear of fork oil in that before I slid it down as well to give it an even nicer time. Uh, the washer and the new bushes clipped into place. So the next thing to do is get my fork outer and slide it on. I've given the fork outer inside a uh, thorough cleaning so we've got no old oil and debris in there so we need to slide that down and then we need to knock the bushes and then the seal into the outer. I tend to try and knock the bushes back into the fork leg before I do the seal. You can get uh, these sort of generic seal drivers uh, that go like that and there's a sort of slide hammer thing that goes with them. Uh, I've spent the extra money and actually bought ones that are exactly the right size and this does make a difference when you're putting the fork seals in, it does make life a bit easier. Obviously if you're only doing one set of seals a year you wouldn't go and spend the money buying all the fancy tooling I've got but I do this day in day out so it is worth spending the extra. So I've knocked my bushes in already so the seal only has to put the seal in. Um, I've give it a little bit of lube around the outside of the seal so it's easier for it to slide into the housing. And then, right, and that is in far enough that we can get the circlip in and then push the dust seal into place. And there we go, seals and bushes and everything we placed into there. So the next thing to do is get some oil in it. So now we're into putting oil back in the forks. Uh, normally I would use Motel 5 weight uh, factory line, uh, but I'm running a little bit low because it's that time of year when everybody's closed. So I'm using some motor, uh, some KTEC stuff instead. It is five weight fork oil, it is very good quality, and so I don't mind which one I use. Right, we shall pour a reasonably large amount into the fork leg until it's relatively close to the top. Then I'm just gonna move the outer up and down a couple of times to make sure I get plenty of oil um, around, the dam uh, around the seals and the bushes. And then I need to bleed up the uh, damper rod inside because at the moment the cartridge will be half full of air. And so I need to keep pumping this up and down until it pulls enough oil into the cartridge that it expels all the air. This will involve quite a lot of pumping and not in the way I'd usually like on a Saturday night. An interesting point here, I can already feel. I push down to there and then I have about... 15 mil in the bump stop and the first just the first little pull back up there's a little bit of resistance while it um, opens the void up in the bump stop so i'm pleased i've reduced the bump stop and if it was a track bike i'd get rid of it completely but just in case i hit some big potholes i'm leaving it in so this fork leg is just about ready uh, i've bled it up so it's a nice consistent damping even when you're pumping the rod up and down uh, i've actually given it a couple of minutes for any air to sort of dissipate out of the oil and now i need to set the air gap the air gap is very important because uh, when the fork compresses the amount of air that's in it obviously compresses and that gives you some spring effect as well um, K takes a 110 mil air gap, which is actually slightly smaller than the original Honda measurement. Uh, your air gap should be set with the springs and spaces and everything removed and the cartridge compressed. And I have a nice big fancy syringe, but a normal syringe in a piece of pipe would do the job. Slurpy slurpy. We'll do it twice to be sure. Happy days. That's the air gap set. Right, we are nearing completion, so it is time to put the spring back in. And then the preload spacer back in. 
The next thing to do is fit this, and this is a new, longer preload spacer. So that's going to sit down there, and I worked out, at the moment we've got 39mm of sag, there was a mill of preload available still on the adjuster, so that would have given us 38mm of sag. What I'd really like to be is about 33, 34, so I want to take 5mm off. But then I wanted some adjustment left, so I went a bit further, so this is 11mm longer than the original. So, with that fitted, little um, steel spacer thing on top of there, and then I need to put this in the spring compressor, pull all of that down, pull the cartridge up, and get the nut back in place. Now that I have my rod pulled up and my spring compressed, the next thing to do is to fit my top cap. Uh, I've removed the needle from the end, as uh, stated by KTAC, and this is the point when it's very useful to know how many clicks your adjuster is supposed to have. Because if your adjuster is meant to have 14 clicks, it's ideal to back the adjuster off, wind it down to 14, maybe even 15 clicks, and then you can just wind the top cap down until it bottoms in the adjuster. And then when, once it touches the bottom, just like that, you can check how many clicks you've got. And it's always useful to check, wind it in and out, check you've got your 14 or whatever clicks you want. And that tells you you've got the right range of adjustment. If you've got 20 clicks and you want 14, it means your top cap is too far out and you need to back the nut off and go down a little bit further. If you have, say, four clicks when you should have 14 then your nut is too far down and basically you're bottoming out all the time on the adjuster at that point you need to wind the top cap out give yourself more adjustment so it's always worth checking you've got the right amount of adjustment before you do all this up and put the fork back together so because of the arrangement with the KTEC bits and the lengths and bits, um, I have slightly different uh, amount of adjusters than I had before, but we still have a good working range. So that means I can tighten up my lock nut. So what I like to do is basically try and hold the top cap still and tighten the lock nut up to the top cap. Fairly snug. And then the top cap can go down. The pressure can be taken off the spring and we can actually put the top cap back on the fork and we're basically done so this is the point before when if i put topped out the top out spring the um space and everything went loose because the spring wasn't engaged and that even if i top the top out spring out there's just a tiny little bit of tension on the spring so that means we actually have a workable range of preload right slide that back together screw my top cap back on we're very nearly done. I have done the top cap up. It doesn't need to be mega tight. It seals on an O-ring, so you don't need to smash that into there and try and pull the threads off it or anything. So that is done. The only thing I need to do now is basically set my adjusters up. So I'm going to set my preload basically in the middle of the range, and that should put, should put me in a good sag setting when I put the uh, forks back in the bike. Uh, there is a KTEC recommended setting for my uh, rebound adjuster and for my compression adjuster. To set your preload, your preload is generally set from all the way off to counting on. So if you want 8mm of preload, you'd wind the preload all the way off and then add 8mm on. With the dampers, it's the opposite way around. You bottom the adjuster out so I can just feel it touching the sort of bottom, going metal to metal and basically blocking the bypass off. And then the first adjuster hole there is 0. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10... 11, 12. So I'm going to start with 12 clicks out of my rebound adjuster, and that's a pretty good place to start. So just a reminder, your rebound and your compression dampers, your clickers, you set from all the way in, you take them out. Preload, you wind on from all the way off. So that is it. One fork done and one to go. Uh, and just remember, once you've rebuilt your fork, ideally keep it upright. Uh, if it's upside down or laid down, it might let some air back into the uh, cartridge and then you'd have to bleed it out again. So always try and keep your fork upright. So I'm back downstairs with a pair of upgraded and serviced front forks for the Honda. So I suppose I better pop this one back in the bike and then that one afterwards. So first thing is to slide my little uh, circlip on that uh, mounts my handlebar in the right position. So that just sits there, and then we can just slip it in the hole, which sounds much more fun than it really is. And when I get fairly close to where I need to be, 
I'm just going to snip the cable tie off that's holding the handlebar in place. And there we go. A fork basically in the bike. Wipe off a little bit of the debris from inside the yoke. Or triple tree or triple clamp if you're one of our very rare American viewers. Now I have the decision as to where I want to have the shower sticker that sticks out on these forks. Pointed towards the back. It's not really anything to show off about, is it? Right, going to nip the yoke up to begin with. Get them all just tightened down a little bit. Make sure the handlebar is located in the uh, top yoke because it has a locating position. Obviously, if you're doing this with ones that you've marked yourself, uh, you need to check the fork height and actually make sure you get the handlebars in the right place. There is a little bit of movement on these, so I'm setting them nice and wide. Right, that's all just nipped up. And now I just need the torque wrench because apparently all of these are 26 newton meters. So that's one fork in and all the uh, clamp bolts tightened up. Time to put the other one in. With both my forks in and everything torqued up, it is time to put a wheel back in. So luckily my spindle is already quite well greased. So we'll take the nut off the other end, slot the wheel in. With some manufacturers, especially Kawasaki, it's actually quite easy to put the wheel in the wrong way round because all the space is the same on both sides. So just pay attention to which way round your wheel is supposed to go. Slide that in. Get it lined up on the other side. Need a little adjustment on there. And there we go, wheel in. And the spindle on this actually sort of pushes against the spacer all the way through the um, fork leg and pushes the wheel into its sort of datum point. So next thing is to put my uh, bolt in the other side and torque everything up. Official torque setting for the uh, big bolt on the front wheel is 59 newton meters, which is about there. Uh, I might go around it later and check it. And the pinch bolts like the forks are 26. So we'll just go around, nip everything up and happy days, we have a wheel in. So that is the forks back in the SP1. Uh, under normal circumstances, what I would do, of course, is refit the mud guard, the brake calipers, the bodywork, recheck the sag settings. Uh, but we're going to be moving on to that a bit later. Uh, for this episode, that is it. So thank you for watching and I hope you've enjoyed it and it has been informative. And the next episode is going to be about servicing your brakes.